In part 10 of our respectful rebuttal of Richard Gage's video, Blueprint for Truth, we're going to be looking at the genuine mystery of the sulfidized steel found in the debris on 9-11. Richard Gage cites Jonathan Barnett in FEMA's Appendix C from late 2001 and says, quote, he found sulfidation and intergranular melting. This, he believes, can come only from thermate, which is thermite plus sulfur. Thermate is quieter and less explosive than nanothermite. It definitely creates a very hot flame that can melt through steel, and he believes it may have been used in the implosive collapse of Building 7. Well, we need to talk about what sulfidized steel is, what Appendix C actually says, and see also if Richard Gage's assertion is true. Sulfidized steel is a mixture of steel and sulfur. Sulfur invades the boundaries of the steel on a granular, kind of a microscopic level. The mixture is called eutectic because the ingredients mutually impede crystal formation. Imagine water ice mixed with frozen alcohol. Melt the alcohol and the entire thing becomes a slurry before you even get to the melting temperature of ice. The melting point of steel is over 2700 degrees. The melting point of eutectic sulfidized steel is 1740 degrees, well within the temperature range of an office fire. Sulfidized steel doesn't happen easily. Richard implies it can happen only if thermites or thermate is used to melt the steel. And you can see thermite melting steel by looking on YouTube, where thermate takes seven or eight seconds to surgically cut through a steel beam like a hot knife through butter. How such a slow process can be used to pull off a precise and instantaneous controlled demolition is a problematic question for Richard Gage. And the result does not look like the kind of corrosion we see on the corroded beams from the World Trade Center. Another big problem for Richard is that there's so little sulfidized steel in the debris. One piece was the horizontal beam from the 53rd floor of one of the towers that was not considered relevant for NIST collapse study because the collapse began many stories higher. Another piece may have come from somewhere in Building 7. That's about it. The few examples were all horizontal beams, not vertical support columns. This can't explain a global collapse. And if you think it was all shipped away so we couldn't see that it was everywhere, 9-11 firefighter Vincent Palmieri testified to me personally that, quote, I saw many steel girders with burn marks on them, girders bent in the fires, but in the massive debris I worked on, I never saw a single example of sulfidized steel. The intergranular melting FEMA talks about is nothing like melting as we know it. The steel wasn't molten. The part with the lowest melting point became part of the slag. The long technical term for the sequence of what happened was intergranular melting, high temperature corrosion via sulfidation, oxidation, and decarburization leading to a liquid iron oxide sulfur mix from grain boundary melting in a very, very small quantity, around 20 microns wide. No, I don't really fully understand that either, I admit. It's a slow, microscopic process during which the steel never became molten in the sense of dripping liquid. The steel just wore off grain by grain. This happened over a period of at least eight days. Corrosion of beams can continue in the weeks following the collapse in the hot debris pile once it has started, as stated in FEMA Appendix C. High temperature eutectic corrosion simply cannot be used as evidence for molten steel. It is not. Non-metallurgists can misconstrue this intergranular melting as, ooh, steel got hot and melted away like ice in the sunshine. That's not what happened. The sulfidation structures would have been obliterated by the 4,500 degree temperatures that thermite reacts at. The presence of these microstructures actually disproved thermate. If these pieces of sulfidized steel were created with thermates, then we would also have seen a lot of aluminum oxide, which we don't see. Those who assert that the white smoke visible in the fires was the aluminum boiling off may not realize that the boiling point of aluminum oxide is 5,390 degrees Fahrenheit, a thousand degrees above the hottest temperature of any thermate. Not only is there no aluminum oxide and no way to account for its absence, there is no sulfur in the Herod Jones riot paper. It's not there, and therefore no thermate. The 9-11 mystery really is how the steel became sulfidized in the first place, and no one knows with certainty. As I've shown, it's not a mystery that is solved by positing thermates, however. Metallurgist Jonathan Barnett, professor at Center for Fire Safety Studies in Worcester, Massachusetts, discovered the sulfidized steel. He wrote in FEMA's Appendix C, quote, the severe corrosion and erosion of samples one and two are a very unusual event. No clear explanation for the source of the sulfur has been identified. The rate of corrosion is also unknown. 
a detailed study into the mechanisms of this phenomenon is needed. Well, in a personal email, Jonathan Barnett wrote, quote, the possible sources of enough sulfur? Heating oil, extra high probability. Construction materials, such as gypsum wallboard dust, extra high probability. Environmental sources, such as acid rain, high. Barnett is fully aware that the findings of corrosion are due to sulfidation attack. He helped determine that in the Barnett, Biederman, and Sisson reports. None of these three authors believe thermate was a likely source. Sisson was quoted on BBC in 2008 saying, quote, I don't find it very mysterious at all that if I have steel in this sort of a high temperature atmosphere that's rich in oxygen and sulfur, this would be the kind of result I would expect. So how is this sulfidation created? But Barnett's claim that the gypsum wallboard near the steel could have provided sulfur seemed to contradict what I knew about gypsum, which is it's relatively inert chemically. That's why it's used as a fire shield around structural steel. But recently I read the CSWC Waste Management website, and that explains certain environmental hazards. They wrote, quote, how is sulfur dioxide formed? Sulfur is present in the waste stream from batteries, plastics, waste oil, and gypsum-filled wallboard. It is released into the combustion gases during incineration and reacts with the oxygen in the air to produce sulfur dioxide. We know that sulfur dioxide was at ground zero at dangerously high levels, so I now agree that gypsum wallboard burned at high temperatures could indeed have created sulfur dioxide in high concentrations, which in turn could have begun the sulfidation process of the steel. Other scientists have proposed fluorine gas from halon-type fire extinguishers or freon from ACs creating fluorosulfuric acid, a super acid about a thousand times stronger than sulfuric acid. Possibly that could explain the rarity and the severity of the corrosion. But in our March 6th debate, Richard Gage claimed, quote, NIST chose to ignore or obfuscate the sulfidized steel. Well, I took a lot of time to argue this and to look at it, and I found that the steel beams could, could not have anything to do with the collapses one way or another. NIST did not ignore it. They mentioned it expressively in their report, along with new geometric analysis and further demonstration of the sulfidation, that it occurred post-collapse and is therefore irrelevant for their study of what caused the collapses. By the time this came along, FEMA had already referred the sulfidized steel question to WPI for further study. NIST felt that they had no more reason to investigate the sulfidized steel than they had to do an extensive study on the air pressure of the car tires in the garage. It was just one of those things that just wasn't obviously not a causative factor in the collapse. I was impressed at first with the arguments around sulfidized steel and the iron-rich microspheres. Two years ago, I was impressed with some of Richard's arguments around the physics of the collapse. But at this moment, there's only one scientific assertion in the 9-11 truth movement which still has the potential to change my mind. That is the 2009 experiment purporting to prove the unexploded thermitic material that was supposedly found in the World Trade Center dust. And that's what we'll be talking about next. Strong evidence will be needed to convince me. And as of June 2011, I feel the results remain inconclusive at best. In the meantime, from a purely scientific point of view, I feel that the call for yet another 9-11 investigation can't succeed until some much stronger evidence is put forth. The overwhelming consensus among scientists and structural engineers favors natural collapse. I do not wish to see scientific consensus overridden by a political investigation. Creationists with a strong religious base, global warming deniers with powerful economic interests are having some success in doing this, end runs around scientific consensus with a lot of intense political maneuvering. As you will see, I support more thermite and dust experiments to attempt to change the scientific consensus around the controlled demolition theory first. If that happens, then an investigation will become inevitable. So far, the science behind the controlled demolition theory has not impressed me. The only reasons I can think of for a 9-11 investigation are political in nature, and we will return to that question at the end of this series.